to accelerate in loss once it started. Finally, the presence of sea ice on the ocean surface alters the heat and moisture exchange between the atmosphere and the ocean. And so in doing this, it alters weather patterns. Now, anybody who listens to the news is going to know that in the Arctic, terrible things have been happening with sea ice. So these are a couple of snapshots taken from the summers of 1979 and summer 2016. And we can see just by glancing at it that there is much less ice in the summer of 2016. In fact, our Arctic sea ice mass has decreased by more than 50% over the last 40 years. This is partly due to the albedo feedback effect that I talked about. On the other hand, the same thing is not happening in the Antarctic, or at least it's not clear that it has yet started. Um, these are two snapshots, again from 79 and 2016, of sea ice at extent around Antarctica, and a glance at them makes it obvious that things haven't really changed by much. Now that's surprising because the ocean has absorbed over 90% of the increase in energy that has happened since climate change began. Now to see just what is happening with Antarctic sea ice, we have to take a closer look. So along the bottom axis there, we have time and plotted is the change in Antarctic sea ice extent. And if you look carefully, you can see that actually it's increasing slowly um, or by a small amount. The trouble is that Earth system models don't predict this. So an Earth system model is a very big model, hundreds of lines of maths, millions of lines of mathematical codes that take in all the uh, factors you might need to know about the weather and predicts what's going to happen in the future. Now, there are things it doesn't predict properly about Antarctica. One of the things about Antarctic sea ice is that not only is it slowly increasing, but the changes are very regionally dependent. So the color, where the colors are redder here, it means there's an increase in sea ice with time. And where the colors are bluer, it means there's a decrease. So there's clearly places where sea ice is, Antarctic sea ice is increasing. And then there's other places where it's decreasing. And this plot taken from Maxim's paper in 2012 shows a whole bunch of model predictions. So on the y-axis, we've got ice extent and along the x-axis, we've got time and all the wiggly squiggles are different models. The black one is the model average and the red is the satellite observation. And you can see they not only don't match in magnitude, but they also don't match in trend. The model average is going down and the satellite average is going up. So maybe there's some missing physics in the models. And turns out that we're looking at some of this missing physics, but in New Zealand, we've picked on the things that we know about. Now, this is a lovely little video clip, thank you, um, taken by Craig Stevens, and it's taken near the coastline sorry, not Steve, Craig Stevens, Craig Stewart of Niwa. It's taken near the coastline of Antarctica and we can watch 
as the sea ice breaks out. So the whole thing is going to be eight hour, 18 hours long. So we're seeing it greatly speeded up. So I would like you to watch as the sea ice gets nibbled away and then is moved away from the edge. Being Antarctica, we're going to see the weather closes in as is standard for Antarctic work. You can see how the ocean is controlling some of this breakup. And yet, at other times, the edge just seems to spontaneously decide to break into little pieces and move away. Here we've got the weather closing in. And somebody is saying, oh no, the weather's closed in. Let's go and fix up that camera. And they'll be here in a minute. They're going to hear come the rescuers. They're coming in the worst weather. Oh, we'll just get rid of that bit. So now here we are, it's continuing. I'd like you to watch out. A tourist ship is about to come in. It will come in on the right and park itself in a little quiet piece of sea ice, a little nudge in the, there it is. And all the tourists get out and say, oh, look, there's some sea ice, how exciting. And then it's going to move. A thing to point out is that you can see the coast there. So this is not only an edge in the sense that it's close to the ocean, it's also an edge in that it's close to the continent of Antarctica. And it's these edges that the New Zealand program has focused on. So here's a broad out view, out overview of what um, the sea ice bit of the Deep South National Science Challenge is looking at. We're looking at the outer margins, which I'm highlighting in yellow there. And particularly, we're going to be looking at how that breakup took place. What you couldn't see in the video were ocean surface waves coming in to the edge and breaking up the ice at the edge. The other thing we're looking at is the inner edge. And I've highlighted in blue there on the map the places where sea ice abuts an ice shelf. And they're, again, a rather special case where sea ice thickness is involved and where we therefore expect that there is going to be some missing contributions. And the overall idea is that we'll take knowledge that we've gained on these two edges of the sea ice and incorporate it into an Earth system model, which will be called the New Zealand Earth System Model. So this nice slide from Alison Cahoot kind of is an overview of the observations that we're making to try and put together modules that will go into the New Zealand Earth System Module. Earth system model. Here we've got an ice shelf and close to the ice shelf we will have or already have oceanographic moorings. We're also going to be doing some ground truth there. I'll look at how we intend to fly over and measure sea ice thickness and then thanks to our friends in the US program we are part or have a collaboration with a Piper's cruise, um, a Piper's icebreaker cruise that is currently in Antarctica at the moment. And so we'll look at some of the work that's being done through collaboration with them. So I'm going to split it into two parts. We'll first of all look at the sensitivity of sea ice to wave ice interaction. And then in the second part, we'll look at the sensitivity of sea ice to this coupling with ice shelves. So over on the left there, you can see there are two slides once again that show the summer and winter extent of sea ice. 
So this is a huge loss of sea ice in just a few months. We know that one of the ways in which this decrease in sea ice happens so rapidly is because ocean waves break up the sea ice and then winds and ocean currents move the sea ice northwards. And Alison Cahoot and colleagues had a nice paper in Nature a couple of years ago that was able to match the trend in the ice edge latitude, which is shown in the pretty pink there, against the trends in ocean wave height. And you can see that they can be made to look as though they're very similar. So along the x-axis is plotted longitude. So this is the hint that ocean wave height might matter when thinking about sea ice extent. And so for that reason, NIWA has a set of wave boys and led by Alison Cahoot, they have been getting these deployed on the Pipers project. The Pipers is a nice, uh, an icebreaker cruise. It's been down in Antarctica since uh, April and it will be there coming back on the 14th of June. So these guys are in the Ross Sea right at this moment and deploying wave boys to measure how waves propagate through sea ice. And this is not sea ice that's a continuous cover, but rather sea ice that's broken up into ice flows. So along with that is there's modeling going on and waves in the marginal ice zone, that's the broken up ice that we're looking at on the left hand side of the picture there. Waves in a marginal ice zone are a two way coupling. So this is a slide kindly supplied by Fabian Montiel at Otago here. So first of all, the waves break up the ice cover and make a distribution of small flows. And then sea ice will penetrate into these flows, these ice flows, and the ocean wave height is reduced. So the sea ice attenuates the waves as they propagate into the ice cover. Nonetheless, you can be 100 or even up to 300 kilometers into the ice cover and still feel the effects of the ocean waves that have propagated from the open ocean. And so the modeling um, needs to consider two factors. It needs to think about the scattering from, of ocean waves by the flows. This is something that doesn't convert energy into heat. But there are also dissipative processes that break up flows, cause collisions, make sound, cause turbulence, and add heat. The idea is that taking the observations um, from the icebreaker and using knowledge from modeling that parameters are uh, become available that can be put into existing large codes such as WaveWatch 3, such as um, NIWA's Wave Sea Ice model, and eventually into the New Zealand Air System model. So that finishes what I want to say about the Waves and Ice program. I have to say I'm not the expert on that, so I will redirect any questions <laughs> on Waves and Sea Ice. I want to spend a bit the second half of the talk just talking about the inner edge of the ice cover. So now we're looking at some of the places I've highlighted in blue on the map. And these are places where an ice shelf abuts the sea ice. So let's take a look at at the sensitivity of sea ice to variations in water that comes from the base of ice shelves. 
So the point I wanted to make in this slide is that the ice on the land interferes with the ice on the ocean. So this is what you would see if you're flying south to Scott Base from New Zealand and you look out the window, you would see the land here. You would see ice that's come off the land here. This feature here is the 15 kilometer wide Dragalski ice tongue. And you would also see some open ocean. This is called the Polinia, a place where the weather is so grotty that all the sea ice gets blown away so that you expose the surface of the ocean. And then down at the bottom of the photograph is sea ice. So the ice on the land is interacting with the ice on the ocean. And it's this interaction that has been my own personal interest for the last, um, uh, the last number of years. So we need to say what's an ice shelf. Um, these blue highlighted places are ice shelves. This is a nice slide from Greg Leonard. In fact, 44% of the coastline of Antarctica is ice shelf, and so 44% of the coastline of Antarctica will be interacting with the sea ice um, during the winter time, at least. And I've highlighted there, there's McMurdo Sound. I've put a picture there of, from Scott's expedition just to remind us that people have been going to this area for a very long time. So it's a great place to work because there's a lot of background knowledge about the system. Carrying on with what's an ice shelf, an ice shelf is not at all salty. It's essentially a massive floating glacier for, that has flowed out onto the ocean to float upon the ocean. It's formed because snow falls in Antarctica and gets squashed up. Um, and so the ice shelf might be hundreds to thousands of meters thick. Now, in comparison, sea ice is only one to two meters thick, very, very much thinner than the thickness of the ice shelf. So let's take a plunge between the, beneath the sea ice near an ice shelf like Pat Wong Pan is doing here at Davis Station through a hole in the sea ice. Let's go down under the sea ice and see what we would see if we looked under the sea ice near an ice shelf. So this is my favorite slide of ice shelf ocean sea ice interaction and it's stolen from Ken Hughes who was a past master student here. It's a slice through the ice shelf. So we have the ice shelf on the left hand side here. And on the right, we have sea ice, nothing to scale here. This is only one to two meters thick. This is hundreds of meters thick. So it's winter time and sea ice is forming. And as sea ice is forming, heat is rejected upwards into the atmosphere. As the sea ice forms, it rejects cold, very salty water into the ocean. And that water, by a bit of jiggery-pokery, finds its way underneath the ice shelf. Once it's there, it interacts with the ice shelf, causing the ice shelf to become liquid. That means that the water around here now becomes less salty. That means it flows up underneath the ice shelf. And in so doing, the pressure changes, which means the freezing point changes, which means all of these details. The important point is that when the water comes back up here, it finds itself at a temperature that's below the freezing point. We call it supercooled water. So we end up with supercooled water near the ice water interface. And in that supercooled water, you can have ice crystals. When these ice crystals come up under the sea ice, we call it platelet ice. 
And here's a nice little video given to me by Paul Zizico at the University of Oregon showing, a, showing an event where ice crystals have come up under the sea ice. So you can see up at the top of the picture there is the bottom of the sea ice and the fluffiness is ice crystals that have accumulated. Please ignore the distracting biology there. You can see the ice crystals have formed a fluffy, slushy layer under the sea ice. We call that platelet ice. And these events where you get ice crystals suddenly in the water column seem to happen rather sporadically, rather like a snowstorm. So that's why I've called the slide, underwater snowstorms do happen. So these tiny crystals come up under the sea ice, they find themselves most super cool, close to the interface so they can grow very large there. Here's Natalie holding one such very large ice crystal. They also attach to anything that's in the water, so any line or oceanographic instrument that is in the water will get covered in these ice crystals, making it sometimes impossible to deploy and then measure things. So this is a gadget for measuring ocean current speed, or it used to be measuring ocean current speed. And they form a mushy, slushy, layer, friable layer at the base of the sea ice um, that just disintegrates in your hands. This layer close to an ice shelf can be thick. So we've seen seven meters of the slushy layer underneath two meters of sea ice. And the presence of these crystals means that the roughness that the ocean sees as it flows underneath the sea ice is changed. So this is another way of looking at these crystals in the water. This is um, work done by Craig Stevens at NIWA. You can see these crystals measured by an acoustic sounder in the water column. And on the right from, I think, Natalie's paper is measurements of the dry coefficient, which is a measure of the roughness as a function of speed. And you can see that there is a huge range of possible speeds, um, possible roughnesses that appear because of the presence of these crystals at the growing ice water interface. And the sea ice is thicker than it would be if the ice shelf wasn't there. So these crystals make sea ice maybe 25 centimeters thicker in the two meters of ice thickness because of this cold water coming from the ice shelf. The whole question of whether the water from the ice shelf also influences the extent of sea ice is a lot more controversial and I'll come back to that shortly. So it turns out that the place where we go, where the New Zealanders go in McMurdo Sound, is a great place to look at ice shelf water outflow. These are contours of ice shelf water outflow. The darker green, the greater the potential to make sea ice thicker. So at the bottom of the slide here, we have the McMurdo ice shelf. This is the sound. This will all be covered in sea ice. These are land. And this is the cold tongue of water that's coming out from underneath the ice shelf. The new things that we want to do is to ask how pervasive is this effect of the ice shelf on the sea ice? We know that it does affect it, but how far north does the effect of an ice shelf extend? And so what we're doing is we're looking actually in both directions. So we want to go north to the Dragalski ice tongue, which we saw previously in a photograph. We want to go into this area here, north of the Ross ice shelf, and by linking in 
to Christina Holb's Ross Ice Shelf project, there are people who are also asking, what does the water look like when it starts off, when it comes from the Ross Ice Shelf in the first place? So we want to extend both north to the end place of the ice shelf water, but also south to where the ice shelf water originates. And these very cold currents influence um, the flow going north. These, and this will be explored. This is being explored by moorings around the Drygalski ice tongue. Um, this is some work by Craig Stevens that's currently in press. He's had sites all the way around this ice shelf, ice tongue, and if you've got questions about that, I will refer you to Craig. The take home message is that this is also a place where we see these under ice platelets. This is also a place where there is clear interaction between the ice shelf or the ice from the land and the ice on the ocean. The part of the work that I'm involved in is going to be trying to tackle what seems like a very simple problem, but one that is very poorly known. So what is the Antarct Antarctic sea ice thickness? I'm ashamed to say we have a very poor knowledge of the distribution of sea ice thickness around Antarctica. And that's because it's very difficult to measure. So the best measurements probably come from ships where they look over the side and at broken bits of sea ice and say, oh yeah, that looks about a meter thick. There are new methods that are using satellite, but these are still really in their infancy. The most reliable way of measuring sea ice thickness is to use electromagnetic induction techniques. And here's the University of Canterbury's EM device sitting on a sled in Antarctica. So what we can do is put this on a sled and then tow the sled around behind a skidoo. And this not only gives us the snow plus sea ice thickness, but we can also get the thickness of this layer of slushy, mushy ice underneath the sub-ice platelet layer. And this is work that's being done as part of Gemma Brett's PhD at the University of Canterbury. We also want to fly these, this EM gadget. So when we put the EM gadget in the air, we lovingly call it the EM bird. So here is the EM bird circled in yellow underneath a helicopter. Um, flying over the McMurdo Sound sea ice. So the way it works is this. Here's the bird and here's the sea ice. The bird has in it a transmitter coil that produces a magnetic field and that magnetic field causes a current wherever there is a conducting medium. Now, when the bird's flying over air and sea ice, the nearest conducting medium is the seawater. So the seawater has currents, it induces currents in the seawater. These currents are then picked up by a, another coil in the bird, by the receiver coil. And so we can work out how far away the bird is from the seawater. And then by careful placing of a laser on on the bird as well, we're also able to tell how far it is from the snow surface. So we know the distance to the seawater, distance to the snow surface, so we can get the snow a nice thickness from it. So that's great. We've done that a few times now with Wolfgang Rack and Christian Haas. We want to go further though, and we want to fly out over the Ross Sea Polynya and we were able, first of all, to get a test flight in 2016 using this beautiful 1943 DC-3 with the EM bird underneath it. There it is, flying over the sea ice in McMurdo Sound. 
Our hope this year is to measure regional sea ice thickness and to go over the sites where the new US icebreaker Piper's Cruise has been making measurements in May and June. So we sort of give them an end point. We'll give them a thickness end point for the sites in which they have been making measurements. And they're down there just now. I put up um, a link to the work that they've been doing and putting up. So here's our plan. Um, like all good Antarctic plans, it's bound to change. So I want to delay on that too long. Um, I finally just want to go back to where we started, which was the mystery of Antarctic sea ice and say, ask really, could ice shelf sea ice interaction play a role in the fact that sea ice appears to be increasing around Antarctica? And we have already been doing some work on this, um, Inga Smith, Cecilia Bitts, and Andrew Pauling have been working on this in the model CESM1 CAM5. And here's the kind of prediction that you can get from this model. So on the bottom here, we have sea ice climatologies from satellite. And again, I've just picked out February, which is summer, and September, which is winter. And here's what CESM CAM5 control runs would give you for sea ice extent in February and September. Not perfect, but at least there's more in the winter than there is in the summer. So this is the work that Andrew's been doing in his master's um, project. The grey runs are a whole set, an ensemble of runs that are run without adding any extra cold fresh water at the surface or at the level of the bottom of the ice shelf. And you can see that with time, like all the other models, CSM CAM5 would predict that sea ice extent, sea ice area around Antarctica would be decreasing with time. Andrew finds he can reverse this decrease. He can reverse that decrease by adding an increase in the amount of cold fresh water from year to year. So here, the blue lines are adding from not to 4,000 gigatons of fresh water per year between 1980 and 2014. And look, he can get the result to go up. Now, it would be tempting to say, hooray, we've done it. The problem is that it's most likely far too much fresh water. So this alone is probably not the answer, or it's not the only answer to the question, what is the missing physics around Antarctica in an Earth system model? So just to recap, on the Deep South National Science Challenge and its sea ice component, I've tried to say that the sea ice part is looking at the outer and inner margins of the sea ice cover. And that's mostly because that's where we have expertise, but they also probably a very important contribution. The aim in the end is to be able to incorporate observations into an Earth system model, the New Zealand Earth system model, we hope it will be. And the final point is just to remind you that at present, the sea ice is only 1500 kilometers away if you live on Stewart Island. Thank you.
Great, thanks Pat. Um, we've got about 15 minutes, so if anyone would like to ask any questions, now's the time. You can either, I said before, you can either chat them through to me if you're on a personal laptop, or you can physically put your hand up in one of the rooms, and I will try and find you. Oh, here we go. Okay. So we've got a question from the University of Canterbury. So I'll just unmute you. Yes. yes. Um, hi. So I've got a, a thank you for the presentation, Pat. It was really good. Um, I was wondering, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about the interaction between the Deep South project and the Piper's voyage and, and what's happening there, please? Yeah, um, there are two strands, Adrian. First of all, Alison um, and Ewa have a number of boys that are being deployed. I believe they were deployed two days ago um, on the way into, well, on the way they will de be deployed as the icebreaker comes out of the sea ice. And then the information will be transmitted by satellite um, back to NEWA. I believe that their plan is to measure attenuation. Um, so that's one strand. Um, NEWA also have an underway CTD on the ship and there are NEWA personnel on the ship um, it might be more appropriate some of the NIWA people spoke to that. Just before I maybe hand over to the NIWA people, um, the link for the sea ice thickness project, um, so there are a, a couple of people coming who we will meet in Antarctica who will make field measurements in McMurdo Sound with us during November and they're part of the Piper's collaboration. So they're from the University of Texas. And then the aim is to fly over the Ross Sea Polynya and the Terra Nova Bay Polynya areas um, to measure sea ice thickness as a sort of, as a, an end point. So they will have measurements from June and we hope to at least give sea ice thickness and some satellite and laser altimetry data from November. So perhaps Neba, do you want to see, is Mike there, for example, Mike Williams or? Yeah. Yeah, anyway, you're on. Just pick you up if you speak clearly. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Pat. Uh, just to talk about a little bit about that, since um, for those of you who aren't aware, Alison Cahoon's just gone on maternity leave, so um, can't field the question yourself. Uh, so the way, boys, we have been deploying, and the way as the ship comes out of the sea ice, so it's way on its way north uh, to measure wave attenuation. This is pretty much a repeat of an experiment that Alison led in 2012 that, led, that was reported that Pat showed in her Nature paper. Uh, the underway CTD and CTD work is really just a contribution that we're making uh, to the voyage. Uh, the US is letting us, letting us use their icebreakers, so we thought we would help out with some things they were having some difficulty obtaining. So it's really a, a bit of quick pro quo, um, but they are also making measurements um, at various ice stations, so we're supporting the oceanography on that side and, and getting some upper water column measurements that we can use to um, integrate with their data sets. Okay. And there was a question also from the NEWA conference room. So I'll hand that over to you. Uh, hi, Pat, it's Craig Stevens. I could have asked you this at lunch yesterday. <laughs> you um, could have. Uh, oh, so just first off to follow on from Adrian's comment, um, there's also, in conjunction with the Piper's voyage, 
Um, there's another connection to Deep South that comes by the ocean in that uh, the Korean icebreaker put in a Piper's Polinia monitoring mooring uh, in February at the same time as it put in our ocean moorings around the Drygowski. So, and the Drygowski is where we're monitoring the sort of the northern end of this, this pathway of ice shelf influence water that Pat talked about. So, so we connect um, on the ocean side as well. But I was just, I was just wondering, Pat, if you had any comments, um, you, you know, I guess we've spent the last five or so years um, talking to the community about how uh, Antarctic sea ice is slightly increasing against all the odds. Mm -hmm. And of course, in the past sort of uh, 12 months, there's been a dramatic sort of shift in what Antarctic sea ice extent is doing. Um, do, do you... Do you think that's an indication that the Earth system models were sort of getting it right all along and it was just something not quite working and now they're clicked into place? Or is something else going on? That's a short question. Um, I th that's a good question, Craig. And um, of course, I don't know the answer. Um, I, think, I think time will tell us. It is, of course, inconceivable that sea ice can keep sea ice extent can keep increasing ad nauseum when the ocean and the atmosphere are getting warmer. So I'm sure that that bit of the Earth system models is correct. The question is really it's all about timing. So is this the turnover happening now, or is it going to be five years from now? or is it going to be 20 or 30 years from now? The other thing I would say is that while our knowledge of the ice extent has been excellent since the satellite era, so since 1979, our knowledge of sea ice thickness in Antarctica is at best pathetic. So I think I think we really can't, we cannot say there has been mass loss, sea ice mass loss from Antarctica, because we don't know that. What we know is that sea ice extent or sea ice area has increased. I don't think we know anything about sea ice volume. So, sorry, it's only to say I know even less than I might have implied I know. But, but, but following from that, Pat, at least in the Antarctic, we know that most of that increase will be first year ice, right? Whereas yes. in the Arctic, where you've got this multi year stuff bouncing around, you know, that, that aerial extent thing for the Arctic is very misle misleading because it doesn't show the thickness change that's going on. That's right. That's right. Yes, you can't just look at aerial extent in the Arctic. And in the Arctic, Thickness has halved on average. Yeah. I mean, it's really seriously bad. And that's mostly because the ice has got much younger. The ice is much younger and thinner than it used to be. Now, wouldn't we all love to say we're all much younger and thinner than we used to be, but we're not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, we've got a, a question from Johnny Williams. Johnny, do you just want to go ahead? Because no uh, one yeah, so my, my question just uh, with regard to the increase in size of the uh, extent of the Antarctic sea ice, is that increase within the bounds of, say, decadal variability? I mean, is it a real increase, or is, it, is, it, or is that impossible to say? That's a good question, Johnny. I mean, there only are four de decades of information. How much do you need? <laughs> I don't know. It's, uh, I mean, when, when people talk about an increase, is, is it, I mean, my brain can say, well, is it definitely an increase or is it? Well, it, it's 1.7 plus or minus one. So, okay. you know, it's, I would need a statistician and a lawyer to say, to make a definite statement, I think. It's like, it's like with people talking about the global warming pause, which now appears to 
not be a pause. You know, that's oh, kind of what I think. Yes, yes. Look, it, it. I think, I think what definitely you can see is that Antarctic sea ice has not decreased in the way Arctic sea ice has decreased. That statement, I, I'm happy to make without a lawyer. Got another question here. Can you take it now, or do you want to go to Canterbury first? Uh, no, I think it's fine. Okay, from Ola Morganston. Just uh, one further comment on this. So a few months ago, there was a paper lit by Terry Mail, I think, from NCAR, and they associated the positive trend that has been seen in Antarctic sea ice extent with um, a shift in the phase of the decadal Pacific Oscillation FPO. Um, if that's the case, then, then you know, as this is an oscillation of the road to the case, which means the trend will not sustain. So that much, uh, and it, 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 it then falls into the category of what Johnny just alluded to, which is the, the hiatus, uh, you know, the super hiatus of global warming was an aspect of um, variability in the climate system, and um, well, the, uh, the increase in Antarctic sea ice extent might as well also have been. A, Olaf, we couldn't quite hear you. Um, and you're going to, would you be able to repeat yourself slightly louder? Is that better? Yes, thank mm -hmm. you. Much better. Yes. So, so I mean, I'm just, I'm just saying that there, there, there was a paper a few months ago by uh, Jerry Meal, I think, was the lead author from NCAR, which associated the trend in 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 CS extent with the interdecadal Pacific Oscillation. And that's a multi-decadal um, sort of feature of variability, which uh, might have a, a, a period of periodicity which is long enough to cover those 40 years. Uh, but it's it's just variability. So um, the models were perhaps right; they just didn't get the. Well, I mean, right. I mean, there are many reasons why they're wrong, but um, but at least the the fact that they showed a decreasing trend is consistent with their physics. Uh, it's, it's, um, if you wanted to have a positive trend in the sea ice, uh, then you would have had to get the right phase of the IPO in these models, and they generally didn't do that. There are many possibilities, I think. Yeah. And we'll just move to the University of Canterbury now. Um, hi, it's just a follow up on Johnny's um, question. I guess um, I was interested in attribution, not necessarily of whether it's a particular physical process or not, but whether you think that um, I've seen some papers talking about natural variability and that the, while the measurement trend is potentially statistically significant, it may be within the realms of natural variability in the system rather than anthropogenically forced. What's your feeling about that, Pat? Um, I, what's my feeling about whether it's anthropogenically, f sorry, I didn't quite, could you repeat so, your question? So it, it, do you think that the trend could just be natural variability in the system rather than being forced by a uh, man at the moment. You mean the observed trend in sea ice area? Yes. Um, I believe it's possible, yes. Okay. But I don't... Um, I think that our lack of knowledge of sea ice thickness, which is really, I mean, it's the sea ice volume or mass that matters, not its area. And I think we have such a huge hole in our knowledge that it is a little tricky to make statements. I mean, my opinion is only an opinion. Yeah, okay. On the the area part, though, isn't the albedo effect controlled more by area than volume, or is the volume and the heat transfer between the ocean and the atmosphere really important as well? Well, it, it's certainly albedo is, it, albedo depends on thickness. 
So the albedo uh, increases as it gets thicker. So it does make a difference. Obviously, if, if it's snow covered as well, that makes a difference. Um, so I think um, thickness matters. You're right that in a in the general sense, the albedo between sea ice and not sea ice, that difference is larger than, oh, well, no. Actually, I didn't bring the albedo plot with me, but the range of albedos that you can have over sea ice is as large as the difference between sea ice and ocean. Okay, thank you. I, I didn't know that. That's, that's interesting. Thank you. Um, it doesn't look like we have any more questions and we have hit one o'clock. So um, thank you, Pat, for your presentation and being, as Adrian said, our first speaker. <laughs> and thank you for everyone to, um, for attending and asking questions and engaging with us on this. Um, we'll be sending out a, uh, an announcement soon for the next talk. Well, thank you all and have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.